praise the Lord we should be live um, looks like there I am okay praise the Lord all right let me get up on the widescreen I'm not going to um, good evening <laughs> I'm not going to um, put it simultaneously on uh, my Facebook page or the church Facebook page uh, because of the challenges we've had in the past apparently the uh, Wi-Fi uh, AT&T their promise of you know no problems and all the bandwidth you need and everything isn't quite exactly what they tell you anyway uh, so by not putting on both uh, pages at the same time we're cutting down the amount of bandwidth we need from what I've been told anyway so we've got it on uh, my Facebook page, William E. Emmons. Now, if, if for some reason we lose that, then uh, go to Periscope. And uh, on Periscope, it's listed under William E. Emmons, E-M-M-O-N-S. And uh, if you go to Twitter, it's William Emmons. And then later on tonight, we should have it on YouTube under Pastor William Emmons. So uh, that's the outlets we're going on right now. Eventually, we're going to be going on uh, all available outlets, uh, one step at a time, as God provides the finances and more partners step in and, and help us to reach out. Uh, and our partners are valuable to us because uh, you're helping us literally reach around the world with this message that we're preaching. And so we appreciate you, appreciate your part in that. Um, anyway, so I just want to let you know what's going on. We are live on on Periscope and on Twitter and on my Facebook page. So things are looking good. I like to talk a little at first just to get give people time to get in and, and uh, you know get tuned in. Hi Brian, good to have you with us. Morgan and Kia, good to have you with us. Hallelujah. Um, I, I wanna mention a couple things. Up here I've got my healing CD. We did this years ago. In fact, probably Brian, when you were here at the church, I think we may have uh, done this CD. It's a healing CD. It's all music created for uh, this CD, and uh, it's it's original music. It's anointed of God, and then I read the healing scriptures behind that, or really in front of that music. Uh, and we have had over forty plus years of having this CD available. We've had more people healed just by listening to that CD. So, uh, you know, if you're in a situation where you've been battling with some, something for a while, it might be worth ordering it. We're making it available uh, pretty much just to cover costs, uh, $5, uh, the cost of CD and postage to you, and uh, that'll get it to you. And what that'll do is uh, give you something you can put on 24 hours a day, let it run. See, Jesus said the word is spirit and life. When the word goes forth, the spirit goes forth. So when we are speaking, teaching, preaching the Word of God, that anointing that's on the Word, the Bible says, destroys the yoke. So the Word goes forth, the anointing is on that Word, it goes forth, the power of the Spirit goes forth with it, and, and people get healed, just like I said, by listening to it. So that's available. Another thing that we've done recently, this is our package for our uh, prayer clause that we've prayed over, we've anointed them, they're anointed of God. Uh, there's scriptures that we've used, and, and if you get it, you'll find the scriptures on there. On the back, you'll have instructions how to use it. But basically, it's like the Apostle Paul says, handkerchiefs or aprons were brought to him. That, that They touched his skin, and anointing went out of him. They took the handkerchiefs or aprons and put them on the sick, and those harassed by demonic activity, they were all healed, and the demons left them, came out of them, it says. So we've done the same thing. We've already had uh, some great testimonies. Uh, if, if you are in a position where you need, you need that extra boost, that extra uh, whatever uh, term you want to use, uh, this may be what's, what uh, will help you. Uh, the anointing is in there. When they threw uh, a dead man in on Elijah's bones in, in his cave, uh, all his bo that was left was his bones, but there was so much anointing stored in those bones that the guy was resurrected from the dead. So anyway, we got these available. Again, we're just really covering cost on them, uh, $5 uh, for those also, and that'll get it out to you in the mail, uh, first class mail. So I want to mention those to you. I uh, want to start off with reading our foundational scripture. 
Let's see who else has joined us. Carol Thornton, good to have you with us. Hey, have you guys moved yet? <laughs> I can ask that because they can, you can actually respond and give me a message. In fact, last week, uh, we had somebody ask a question that I did not see until the end of the Bible study, and I did sit right down and answer them immediately. Uh, so if you've got questions related to what I'm ministering on, or you want to give us a quick testimony we can share with everybody, don't, we don't have to use your name necessarily, uh, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This is my foundation scripture for our ministry. This book of the law, which is the word of God, shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate. Now, it's interesting. He, he linked the word mouth and meditate. The reason for that is the word meditate, uh, In look it up in the Hebrew and the Greek, he discovered that primarily it means to speak the word, not just to think on it. 75% of the one word definitions in Strong's Concordance deal with speaking in some form, and only 25% deal with thinking about it, like we think of meditating. So, very powerful, three times more power in speaking than there is in thinking. Amen. All right, you shall meditate it day and night that you may observe, that's gain insight, and do all that's written therein. Then, I love this. Then you shall make your way prosperous. It doesn't say God has to do anything for you. It says you shall make your way prosperous, and then you will have deal wisely and have good success. And again, I think we all want to do that. We want to prosper. We want to deal wisely. We want to have good success. So um, with that in mind, I'm going to get right into the message tonight. And uh, again, it's good to have everybody with us that's here so far. Asia Ross, good to have you with us. Hallelujah. Um, the question that we got last week uh, that I didn't see until the very end is, um, do you believe we have the ability through faith to make something happen? Excuse me for scratching my ear. When I speak, sometimes I get, <laughs> I've had a vibration in this ear and it tickles and I have to kind of do that. Anyway. Uh, do you believe that by uh, that we have the ability through faith to make something happen that we speak it in real faith and it will happen and my response was yes but then I qualified it and I gave the person that asked the question some qualifying scriptures but I just let, felt like the Lord spoke to me and said everybody needs to hear that so tonight after we do the introduction or the recap I should say uh, I'm going to get back on that subject. After all, we are studying two kinds of faith, and there's the head faith uh, based upon you know natural things that you can touch, taste, feel, smell, so forth. You believe in something because you can see it, you can touch it, you feel it's real. And then there's the spiritual faith or the God kind of faith, which is something you have to take at, at God's word. And we believe it not because we can see it with our physical eyes, we believe it because, first of all, God said it, and secondly, because we've developed a, a level of faith and, and time spent meditating the Word of God, that inside we begin to see it, and we begin to see ourselves healed in here, not just up here, because if you look by uh, natural circumstances, you may not look healed, you may not feel healed, but when you develop your faith inside, all you can see is yourself healed. So we're talking about two kinds of faith, and uh, let me go ahead and, and get the recap started, see who else has joined us, okay? Uh, we were talking last week about uh, covenant rights in prayer. Uh, in our covenant with God, God gave us covenant rights and put us in a covenant relationship with himself. Now, God did this. We didn't do it. He did it with uh, what went clear back to the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve after they fell. And uh, then we see uh, covenant actions being taken by God when he killed an animal and took the skin and covered their nakedness which was symbolic of their sin and uh, so God performed the first sacrifice creating the first blood covenant with Adam and Eve and we know this because when Cain and Abel came to present their offerings one was acceptable and one was not and and when you look at Abel's offering he took the first ling, the first ling, a year old uh, you know, uh, a lamb from his flock. And he offered that up as a sacrifice. And we see that theme throughout the Bible, offering God 
the first fruits as a way of honoring God, but also as an act of recognition of our covenant relationship with God. Every time we receive communion, we're doing the same thing. We're, we're doing symbolic gestures or actions which remind us that we are in covenant with Almighty God. Now, just a quick thing on covenant. When two people enter into covenant, they literally, the understanding is they become one. They're no longer two individuals. In, in marriage, uh, we see that. Uh, okay, I've got a message here on Periscope attempting to reconnect. Um, uh, we're good on Facebook, so I'm not, uh, normally Periscope keeps on going. Um, please check your network settings. Uh, all right, now it says busy, so we'll see if it's still live streaming on Periscope. Um, we're getting through this, we're getting over that in the name of Jesus. I'm able to connect, it does say live streaming. So if you're watching on Periscope, I can't see what's going on uh, because I'm not connected to the camera any longer, but it does say <clears throat> live streaming. So I believe that's, that's still going. All right, so when we're in the covenant, we enter into a relationship where the two become one. We give up, quite literally, we give up personal rights and we give that to our covenant partner. And the understanding is that we die to self and we live for our covenant partner. All that we have, all that we represent, all of our might, power, ability, we give to our covenant partner, even to the point of laying down our lives for their life, to spare them. Well, that's the covenant God made with Adam and Eve. That's the covenant God made with Abraham. That's the covenant God made with Jesus. And us in that covenant receive the same thing. So Cain and Abel come before God. Abel brings the sacrifice, which was a death. There had to be a death to pay the price to temporarily cover their sins. And they got that from Adam and Eve, their parents. Otherwise, how would they know? So Cain comes along. Cain brings an offering. No sacrifice. It was just uh, the fruit of the ground. And he, you know, he kind of went around and picked and said, I'll take this and I'll take that and I'll give that to God. When God had already laid out the terms, there had to be a death. There's no death in a cucumber or carrots or potatoes or whatever. So there had to be a, a death. Uh, there had to be blood spilled because later would be the death of Jesus and the blood of Jesus that would purify us from all sins. So that began way back in Genesis. Now, in covenant with God, God has given himself to us to be our God, and we are giving ourselves to him to be his people. And that's what you see God say about Abraham when you go through and read uh, where God made covenant with Abraham. All right, so what does it mean to be for God to give himself to us? It means all that God is, all that he possesses, all that he represents, his might, his power. He gives himself to us to the extent that he sent Jesus his only begotten son as the supreme sacrifice giving his son on our behalf to die once now for all sin for all man for all time to pay the price hallelujah all right so in covenant you can go to genesis uh chapter 13 verses 14 through 18 read all of genesis 15 and 17 and you'll see this covenant with abraham and uh, you'll see what God did. You'll see it was very one-sided. In fact, God even put Abraham to sleep. And God performed the covenant ceremony. And, and everything he did was symbolic of something that would be done on our behalf. And then later on, of course, Abraham wakes up and he realizes, now I'm in covenant with the creator of the universe. Hallelujah. We are too. All right. Now, we read in Isaiah 43, verses 25 and 26, and I'm just going to take one statement out of it and and the Bible tells us the word to plead our case well you know you you read that on face the face value and it's easy to get the idea well you know I've got to beg God that's not what it's talking about if you've ever sat in a court and you've heard the uh, the defense and the prosecuting attorneys they're pleading this their cases before the judge or the jury and what they're doing is they're laying out a foundation of why what they want is the right decision in that matter. 
So they bring in the facts, they bring in the information, they bring in proof, you know, whatever it is that they're trying to prove. Well, when it says we're to plead our case, we, we need to understand we're not begging God for anything. What we're doing is we're laying out our prayers based upon facts, based upon information, based upon what God has said. We go to God in prayer, like the Bible says, come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain help and mercy. Now, God's not holding anything back from us. But if we expect our prayers to work, we've got to have a foundation of Scripture or God's Word to base them on. Otherwise, they don't carry any weight. And so we go to the Word of God. We find out what God has said about what we're dealing with. And then we base our prayers upon what God has said. And we bring that to God in a pleading or a, a, uh, a presentation. Father, you said this, you said this, and you said this. And because you said it, I believe you're not a man that you should lie. I believe that you're a covenant-keeping God. I lay my case out before you, and, and your word says I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. So I am now declaring that I receive healing in my body, and I go out of this, uh, th this um, conversation, this prayer time, with my healing. It's mine now, okay? I pled my case. So these are part of the covenant rights we were getting to last week. Didn't get to that exactly, but um, now you understand how prayer really has a legal uh, uh, way of presenting itself so that we know we're going to get results. As long as God laid the foundation and said it was ours, we can ask for it. And the Bible says he'll give it to us. All right. Uh, when God made a covenant with Abraham, Abraham was promised certain things. And I mentioned those just briefly. Uh, he would promise that God would be his God, specifically. That he would become God's man or covenant partner. In covenant, and I said this already, God gave all that he had to man. All of heaven's vast resources are available to us. He's already given us Jesus. He's already given us the, the life of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. He's already given us the Holy Spirit. He's already given us his written word. Uh, he, he's given us uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting process of our lives. And, and so he's given us so much already, it's hard to imagine what more could we ask for. But when you have a specific need, of course, that's where you take it to the Father. And Father, in the name of Jesus, by the way, there is no other name. It's not Muhammad, it's not Allah, it's not Buddha, it's not uh, Confucius. The only name there is under heaven by which men might be saved or delivered is the name of Jesus. When I was told one time I, I couldn't use the name of Jesus in a public prayer setting uh, when I was a, a baseball coach, I said, I'm sorry, there's no other name that gets results. If, if, if these kids are going to get healed on my baseball team from an injury they have right there on the spot, it's going to take the name of Jesus. And they didn't like that, but you know what? They didn't kick me out because <laughs> it was working. And kids got injured and they got healed because I would pray for them. The name of Jesus, praise God. A covenant person has a legal right to call on their covenant partner at any time for any need. And you can call on God any time for any need. Hallelujah. Right now, I'm, I'm boy, I tell you, this has been happening a lot to me. Sunday, I was I was going to pray with somebody, and, and God gave me a word for them. Right now, I'm, I'm picking up, uh, somebody's got a shoulder problem out there. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm sensing is the right shoulder... And this may be somebody who tunes in later. It may not necessarily be somebody that's listening right this moment. But the right shoulder, you've had some kind of, uh, I don't know if it was an injury, but you got aching in your shoulder right up, right up through here in this area of the joint of the shoulder and so forth. And I call that healed right now. I command that aching to go. In Jesus' name, I command you to heal right now. Now, if you think, well, I wonder if that was for me. Yeah, it probably was for you. Uh, if you listen to this tonight, tomorrow, down, the, down next week, next month, next year, and you've got that problem, the anointing is on those words also. So receive it by faith. Say, Father, I receive my healing of my shoulder, like Pastor Bill said, in Jesus' name. All right. Believers are heirs. Now, you got this is really important. Believers are heirs of Abraham, which means we're heirs to the covenant promises and the exciting thing is, 
that we get all the blessings and all the promises of the covenant with none of the curse. Hallelujah. That's, that's pretty one-sided. So we're heirs of Abraham, and then it says we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ in the new covenant. So we got all the blessings of the old covenant, bring them in and add to them all the blessings of the new covenant, and, and I mean, everything you need, it's there. So praise God for that. All right. Now, let me give you a couple of references. The covenant partner sect area, uh, Hebrews 4, 16, uh, John 5, 7, 15, I'm sorry, John 15, 7 through 8. And then the heirs of Abraham and the promises are Romans 8, 17, Galatians 3, 29. Praise God. Well, Facebook is still going. Uh, let's see who's there. Okay, see all you guys. Hi again. Uh, live streaming. Mevo says it's live streaming, so on Periscope, I believe it is. All right, so let's get into uh, picking back up uh, where uh, I answered that question last week that was presented. Uh, as covenant partners with God, I'm going to lay some foundation here. As covenant partners with God, we speak covenant words when we speak the word of God. That, that's really a simple statement, but you need to get the reality, get the revelation of that. Spend some time meditating upon that. As covenant partners with God, we speak covenant words when we speak the word of God. Now, I'm not saying going around, you know, uh, just reciting scripture to everybody and going around uh, like we've seen people, you know, they can, uh, they can talk all kinds of scripture uh, that they, they've memorized it and they can, you know, re rattle off all kinds of scriptures. That's the, really not what it's talking about. When we talk covenant talk, we're talking God's covenant promises specifically related to our need. All right? The Bible says Jesus bore our infirmities, uh, our sicknesses, our diseases, our pains, our sorrow, our punishment. It says, by his stripes ye were healed. So if I'm going to talk covenant talk related to healing, I'm going to say, Father, I thank you that Jesus bore my sicknesses, my diseases, my pains, my sorrow, my punishment, even my poverty, lack, and want. He bore my oppression. He bore, bore my depression. He bore my fear. He bore my anxiety. How do I know? Because that's what the covenant says. I thank you, Father, that because by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. And since I was healed, that means it's past tense, it's already done, I am healed. That's covenant talk. What am I doing? I'm simply taking what God has declared in covenant with us as promises, and I'm declaring it back in faith. I'm talking covenant talk. Hallelujah. Amen? All right. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I'm going to read from the King James Translation. Torsha Walker, good to have you with us. Hallelujah. You're here. I know you're here. Praise the Lord. Um, by the way, I want to mention uh, every week for the last few months, uh, Kia uh, and Morgan have uh, been tuning in. And uh, from what I understand, they're going to be back here, moving back here uh, by the first Sunday of August. Ah, praise the Lord. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Uh, and, and they are going to be getting involved. Morgan is committed to be here and help me uh, do this and handle the equipment and make sure everything is working right. And uh, I believe that's... Uh, now I see Mevo says, Ray, see Morgan, you really need it to take care of all this. And uh, so I don't know what happened to uh, Periscope. It was it said live streaming and then all of a sudden it changed and said ready, unable to uh, connect. Okay, Morgan, you got your work cut out for you. So looking forward to get, you getting here in a couple weeks. All right, getting back. 2 Corinthians 4, 13 and 14, King James. Uh, verse 13 says, We having the same spirit of faith as, as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore we speak. Well, what do we believe? Do we believe there are men on the moon? <laughs> do we believe there's aliens flying through our skies? Uh, if you do, you don't know your Bible uh, because the Bible tells us what these so-called aliens are. They're spirits, spirit beings, and, and I'm not going to get into all that. Anyway, um, 
but we need to understand that there's a lot of things Christians believe that are not scriptural. Okay, the you know when we, for example, well sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says no, sometimes God says wait. Well, the Bible says, "Ask and you shall receive." The Bible says that the promises of God are yes and amen, which means so be it. What? That means I get results. I pray, God answers. Amen? Now, I'm talking kind of forcefully here. The microphones are across on the cameras over there. Uh, I have a new microphone. I thought I'd be able to use it tonight, but the cable wasn't long enough. So by next week, we should have that in operation. <clears throat> when somebody says, well, maybe God's trying to, maybe God made me sick because he's trying to teach me something. What they're doing is talking unbelief because it's contradictory to the Word of God. All right? It was unbelief that got Israel in trouble. It was unbelief that caused them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Throughout the Bible, it was unbelief that caused problems for people. Praise God, we're not operating in unbelief, we're operating in faith. But in order to get results, the words that we speak have to agree with what God has already declared, not what we feel, not what we think, not what traditional religion has taught us. Sometimes God will, sometimes God won't. Oh, we believe in healing, but uh, it's never for me. It's always for somebody else or for the preacher. Love the great healing testimonies, but the problem is trying to get somebody to say, I'm healed. You know, I've asked people, well, you believe in healing? Yes. Are you healed? Well, no. <laughs> well, why not? The Bible says you are. Why aren't you saying what God says? See, our words carry so much power, they can literally change the atmosphere we are in. They can change the situation we're dealing with. They can ch our words of faith can change people's hearts. Now get this, some research now, scientific research has discovered that our words have the power to literally change our very DNA. That's pretty amazing. If our words can change our DNA, and they've done this through many, many experiments over many years, they've discovered this, then what ought we to be saying? What kind of words should we be speaking? Should we be speaking words of sickness and disease and poverty and lack and inability and and, and you know uh, oh I don't know if I can do that I, I I just don't have the education or I can't I can't do this I've tried to work the word can't out of my vocabulary because I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me and and that's the that's the way you got to approach it the word said it so that's all I'm settling for I'm not settling for less than what God has promised me if God said I can do all things, bless God, I can do all things. Well, can you leap a building in a single bound? I don't need to. Could I? You know, we, we kind of get silly sometimes with these questions. Whatever I need to do, I can do. If I choose to do something, not because I need to, but because I want to, <coughs> excuse me, I still have the word. That says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So don't go getting silly on it. Just understand that, you know, if we come across a situation, if I need to walk on water, and bless God, I can walk on water. We already have proof of that in the Bible. That's more, more than one time. So what we need to do, we can do. If there's something that I want to do, and I believe in my heart, I mean, I've got the revelation and I can see it in my heart. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't see myself flying. I have dreams of flying. I, I wonder how many of you out there have dreams of flying. Hey, Olin, good to have you with us tonight. Praise God. Uh, I, if, if I needed to fly, I don't know how it would happen. I don't know how God would make it happen, but I've got news for you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we've got to quit being silly about it and quit challenging the Word of God and start accepting that God knows what He's talking about. If He says, I can do all things through Christ, and that's the bottom line for me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I'm looking over at our Wi-Fi lights over there. Now, praise God, Facebook is still working. I, I declare it's going to continue. 
All right. So, what kind of words did Jesus speak? Let's let's look at the example. John 12, 49, King James translation. For Jesus said, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. So let's stop right there. What did he just tell us? He said, in one place, he actually says, I only speak what I hear the Father say. In fact, he goes on and says, and I only do what I see the Father do. So how biblical are we supposed to become? Well, at least as much as Jesus, where we begin to only say things that pertain to our lives according to what God has already declared for us. That we should be willing to commit to doing in this life what we see Jesus doing in this life. Now, that's, that shouldn't be too hard to figure out. Again, let's not get weird about it. Sometimes we think we're so super spiritual, you know. Let's just be simple about this. Let's take what God said, and let's apply it to our situation. You're not dealing with having to fly. You're not dealing with having to walk on water right now. You're probably dealing with the family relationship or dealing with uh, maybe something in your body or maybe finances, maybe your job, whatever it may be. Let's take the Word of God and apply it to things that we really are facing and watch God keep His promises, His covenant promises to us. John chapter 14, verse 10, King James Translation. Jesus says, Believest thou that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So he talks about the words and the works. Apparently the works are linked to the words he's been speaking. Amen. All right. Jesus made a habit of speaking according to God's word when he was ministering. In fact, the only place we see anything that could be considered or construed not God's word was when he was praying under that tremendous test. And he says, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup, what, what cup? The, the sacrifice he was about to go through. Let this cup pass from me. We see his humanity there. But then he submitted his will to try and do it some other way to God's will, which was the only way that the sacrifice and the payment for our sins could be accomplished. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Praise God. Praise God that he did that for us. Amen? All right. Luke chapter 17, verse 5. Let me see if anybody else has joined us. All right. Praise God. Got a bunch watching. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 17, verse 5. From the Young's Literal Translation... This is after the disciples asked Jesus, increase our faith. Here's his response. The apostles said to the Lord, add to us faith. This is, remember, Young's literal translation. Add to us faith. And the Lord said, if you had, or if ye, or you, had faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye would have said to this sycamine tree, now he's standing there, he's talking to him, and he points to a tree. He said, if you had faith, even the grain of a mustard seed sized faith, you would have said, or you would say to this tree. He wasn't talking, uh, uh, you know, just trying to illustrate it, but you know, he was, try he was showing a tree. He said, you'd say to this tree. What did he say? Be rooted up, planted in the sea, and it would have obeyed you. If you had faith, you would have said. So first of all, they say increase our faith. So in, in saying what he said, he's actually giving them the, the clue or the instructions on how to have the kind of faith that they needed to have. He said you'd say. If you had faith, you would say. Amen? All right, so... Uh, this is how, in fact, you go back in, in the Genesis, you find out this is how God created all things. It says, and God said, and God said. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 from the Amplified Translation, therefore be imitators of God, copy him, follow his example as well beloved children imitate their father. 
Now, I can remember back when, when our kids were small and then as our grandkids came along. In fact, I was just thinking about my granddaughter, Autumn. Um, I was, we were sitting there driving down the street after church. She always wanted to ride with me because I was driving my Corvette. So she, all the kids you know, kind of vied for the opportunity to ride with me. But I remember every time we went somewhere, I had music on, and I'd be keeping rhythm with my hand on the gear shift. You know, I'd be tapping it, you know, whatever it was I was doing. And I'd see out of the corner of my eye, she'd be over there, and she'd have her hand on the, on the armrest, and she'd be looking at me and, and tapping and copying my example. And I, I noticed that, and I, I noticed it with all my kids, I noticed it with my grandkids, they try and copy the examples that they, that they respect and, and want to follow, and they imitate you. And that's exactly what the Bible says we're supposed to do toward our Father. That we're supposed to copy His example. We're supposed to imitate Him. In other words, act like God. I had somebody challenge me one time. They said, well, you just act like God. Yeah. Well, that's what the Bible says. I should act like. What do you want me to act like the devil? <laughs> we're called to act like God. We're called to be uh, God's representation in the earth. When people see us, they ought to be seeing God. When they hear we, us talk, when they hear we talk, <laughs> when they hear us talk, they ought to be hearing God in our words. Amen? So, let's back up a little bit. We're told to copy God's example. How did God create all things? Go, let's go back to the statement I made. He, in Genesis chapter 1, when it says, in the beginning, God created. All right? God said. The first thing he created, it says, God said. And what did God say? God said, light be. And light was. Then he goes on and says a whole lot of other stuff. Let the waters bring forth, the fish swimming through the seas, let the earth bring forth creeping creatures, and let the skies bring forth the fowl of the air. Uh, let the waters be separated from the, from the uh, land. I mean, he goes on and on and on. Let the earth bring forth. Everything God did in those six days of creation was done with words. God said, let us make man in our image. And he didn't wait around to get permission from anybody. He, he took some of that dirt, he formed and fashioned, and he, picked, he created a body from the elements of the earth, and then he breathed into that body his life, his nature and the life of the body. The Bible, body, the Bible says he became a, a living soul. One translation says he became a speaking spirit. We have a body made of elements of the earth, but that's not us. We are spirit beings. We're made in the image of God. God made us an exact duplicate in kind. That's what it's talking about. God is a spirit. So we're made just like God. We're made to, to act like God, talk like God, to do the things in this earth that God did when he created this earth. Now, if you look at the garden, and I'm kind of getting a little side trail here, but if you look at the garden, I've said this for years, that the garden was God's pattern. Now, having been an architectural designer and also worked in uh, supervisory uh, positions as a construction superintendent, I got a chance to design buildings and then go out on the site and supervise them being constructed according to the pattern that I had drawn and designed. I understand that thinking, okay? So here God makes a pattern, and it's called the Garden of Eden. And he puts man in it. Now God could have made the whole earth the garden, but he didn't. He took a small place, he made a garden, it had running water. It had great weather, never too hot, never too cold. Uh, there wasn't any rain, per, you know, the Bible says the, the, everything was watered by the mist that came up out of the ground. The fruits, the vegetables grew, the animals were friendly. Uh, I, I look forward to the day during the millennium when I can go hug a polar bear and I can, I can sit down and roughhouse with a polar bear or a grizzly bear uh, or go ride a buffalo. You say, oh, that's kind of weird nuts. It's just thoughts I've had. I've been out seeing these animals in the wild, you know, hunting, and I thought, man, I, I want to go out there and I want to hug a bear, you know. Um, in the garden, they could do those things. Why? 
because there was no sin nature yet, and and there was no death, and there was no evil um, motivations in humans or animals, and and so you know, laying down and sleeping, you know, leaning your head back against a bear, would not have been an unnatural thing, but that pattern of peace and prosperity was a pattern God gave to Adam and he told Adam now go out from here subdue the earth what's that mean it means take control subdue it put it under your dominion and authority he says have dominion over it over all the works of my hands that includes everything God made in the natural realm and he's in one translation says and use all the vast resources that I have placed in the earth for you. We're not going to run out of water. We're not going to run out of oxygen. We're not going to run out of oil. Uh, we're not going to run out of anything that we have need of in this earth. And in fact, we're never going to run out. Even through the tribulation period, thought a lot of stuff's going to get polluted by all the stuff that's going to go on. But during the thousand year millennial reign, it's all going to be refreshed and renewed at the end of the thousand years. Bible says God's going to recreate the earth. Hey, Cecil people, it's good to have you with us tonight. Hallelujah. God's going to recreate the earth, and it's going to be uh, totally a brand new environment once again. But we're not going to run out of anything. God knew exactly how long it would be that man would need to occupy this earth, and he didn't make it to run short of anything. I'm not worried about having water. I'm not worried about having oxygen. I'm not worried about having things to eat. It's out there. There's plenty of it. What we got to do is believe God. Amen? So Adam and Eve were supposed to take what happened in the garden as the pattern and then go out into the earth that was not developed and do what God did. Now, how did God do it? He spoke words. <laughs> how else could Adam do it? He would have to do exactly what, he's, what, what God did when God created all things. Follow God's pattern. And he spoke words of faith that were based upon what God did when God created the garden. Adam and Eve were supposed to go out and do exactly the same thing. And even today, you can go out and you can take dominion and authority over elements in, in, your, in your sphere of influence, your garden, let's say, and you can plant uh, you know, seeds, and you can speak to them, and <coughs> excuse me. And something we've seen, and I, I know science has proven this: if you plant a plant in your house, you put put it in a pot, and you speak words and play good music, and and you speak positive words to it. And this is just in the natural. That plant thrives. If you speak words of death, well, my plants always die. I don't know what's right. I guess I don't have a green thumb. And they always seem to die off in three or four months. And, you know, your words are affecting those, those plants because they're under your dominion and authority. And your words carry power. Your words are like cup. I've got a uh, beat up old cup here that uh, has my iced tea in it. Good iced tea. That carries something. Your words are like that. They carry something. They carry power, either creative or destructive. All right, so I'm getting into a little more detail than I had planned on, but it's important that you get these principles down because if we're going to copy God, we're going to have to change the way we talk about things. When the Bible says I'm healed, I say I'm healed. Well, what about this? What about that? Well, what about it? You know, when I had that growth on my arm for the last three or four years, now nobody, probably most people know better than ask me, but nobody asked me about it. It was ugly. I saw it every day. I never cried, never whined, never went to my wife and said, oh, yeah, I don't know what this is. I wonder if it's cancer, you know. Finally, when I was sharing the testimony with somebody, they said, well, what was it? I said, to be honest with you, I don't really care what it was. All I know is it wasn't God. It wasn't blessing. I know it was under the curse because the Bible says in Deuteronomy uh, 28, verse 61, even if, the, if it wasn't named in there, verse 61 says, including every sickness... And every disease not written in the book is under the curse. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath, past tense, done, redeemed us from the curse. So anything under the curse has no part, no place in me. 
hallelujah, has no place in you either. Reject the curse. The Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee. How do you resist the devil? You start declaring the promises. You start declaring the answer to his attack against you. Amen. All right. Now, let me, let me see where I left off here. Okay. Uh, Mark 11, 22 and 23. Uh, this will help you. And uh, if the person that asked that question last week tunes in later, this, this will help you tremendously. Mark eleven twenty two. I'm going to read King James on this one. This is after the fig tree had dried up. Remember, the disciples were amazed. All right. Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. But that's really not a correct translation or complete translation. If you go do some study in the, in the uh, Greek, what it literally is saying is have the faith of God. The faith of God. How in the world do I have the faith of God? Well, you go to the Word of God, you find out what God said and what God did, and you act like God, and you say and do what He did. You're using God's faith. But where do I get that from? Remember the seed that was dealt to every man, the seed of faith? There's been dealt unto every man the seed of faith. You've got the seed. The difference between you and somebody that maybe is getting more results than you're getting is what you do with the seed. Do you develop the seed? Do you water with the washing of the water of the Word of God? Do you pull the weeds out by, by uh, coming against the doubt and the fear and the unbelief? Do you continue to, to declare God's Word over your situation? That's all part of the process. So what happens is we can develop that little seed into a big thing. Peter, now, now I, th I think we don't have no argument on this one. It took great faith for Peter to walk on the water. Well, I think we're all in agreement. If not, go walk on water. Go ahead, try it. <laughs> find, we'll find out real quick if you got great faith or not. Peter had great faith. He walked on water. All right. When he got his focus off of what? Jesus, who is the living word. He got his focus off the word. So let's backtrack for a couple minutes here. He saw Jesus walking in the water. He said, Lord, if it be you, bid me come. Well, first of all, Peter determined how Jesus had to respond. Because if Jesus had responded any other way, Peter would have rejected anything he said as a demonic presence. So Jesus said, it's me. Come. Well, the word come. Now, now think about this. When God moves in a situation where there's more than one person around, and, and there's a word given that's not specific by name to a person, that word's open for anybody. And all Jesus said was, come. The word come was available to anybody in that boat. I believe, <laughs> I believe every, everyone in that boat could have jumped out there and walked on the water. They could have had a dance party on the water. They could have got out there and celebrated. But Peter showed by, by what happened to him, he got his focus off of the word that was spoken and got it on the circumstances. The circumstances were wind and waves. So let me ask you something. If there's no wind and there's no waves, can you walk on water? Uh, most of us would sink to the bottom. <laughs> All right, so the wind and the waves have nothing to do with it. You go out of somebody's swimming pool and it's perfectly flat like glass and you try and walk on water. See, it... it <laughs> It doesn't matter the circumstance. That has nothing to do with whether or not you can walk on water. What has something to do with whether or not you can walk on water is do you have God's word on it? You understand what I'm saying? If you have the word on it, you can do it if you need to. We read, there, there was a book, um, I think it was called Like a Mighty Wind back in the 70s. It was about a revival going on, going on in, uh, I believe it was Indonesia. Uh, they would walk through jungles at night. Now, there's no lampposts uh, on the jungle trails at night. And they give testimony how they would go from village to village at night, and there would be a light go before them and light the trails, the paths, from village to village. And there was nobody there with a, with a torch or anything, but God provided a way for them to walk from village to village at night. And then they would come to rivers, and they, they needed to cross rivers and they remembered the scriptures where Peter walked on water and, 
and in the Old Testament where uh, you know the the priests uh, you know they put their feet in the water and the water divided and, and um, they began to by the word believe they could do the same thing and they would step into the water and they'd walk across now how do you explain that well they had to get from one side to the other and there was no bridges and so they used their faith and they believed God now in most cases today we have bridges when we need to get from one side to the other we got boats and bridges and we're not faced with a need to do that but if we needed to why could we not do what Peter did if Peter could walk on water we could walk on water amen thank you <laughs> all right let's see any more visitors hallelujah all right so let's go back to mark 11 22 jesus answering said unto them remember they saw the fig tree dried up they were amazed have the faith of god have the faith of god have the faith of god the only way i'm going to have god's faith is to have god's word in me because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. If I want God's faith, I've got to have God's word. You get it? Okay. Verse 23. For verily I say unto you, now listen to this statement. He's now giving the details. Verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Well, first thing was, there was a tree that he talked about in Luke. And then we read about the fig tree that dried up. Now we're reading about a mountain. This is not just, you know, some fantasy where Jesus said, well, if there was a mountain, he'd stand there, he'd, well, he pointed to a fig tree, he pointed to another sycamine tree, and now he's pointing to a mountain. All right? Let's not try to make fairy tales out of it. Let's look at it for what it says. All right? You would say unto this mountain, you would do what? You would say. Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that what he saith, that's twice he said it, shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. If I sound like I'm getting loud, I'm getting more excited. I'm preaching myself happy. Happy. <laughs> All right. There was a man uh, years ago, and I'm sure he's still alive today, but uh, I believe his name was Johnny Johnson, who worked for the government, I forget what capacity now, high up in the government ranks. And he, he got a hold of that. He lived in a house that was on apparently on, on some kind of a bluff overlooking a bay, except between his house and the view, there was a, a hill, uh, you know, a dirt hill there. And he got a hold of this, and he decided he was going to begin to do what that said. And he started talking to that mountain or that, that mountain of dirt or that hill of dirt. And he said, I command you to be plucked up and cast into the bay. There was no beach down there in the bay. Just rocks and stuff. So he said, I, I command you in the name of Jesus to be plucked up and cast into the bay. And he said it every time he thought about it. He said it when he came home. He said it when he left. He woke up in the morning, looked out the window. He said it to it. And uh, time went on. I forget now how long it was. But one day they hear the sound of tractors and they wake up and look out the window and across the, the road from them are these big earth moving tractors and they're digging at that mountain or that big hill and he goes out there and he says what, what's going on and he said well you know the, and the, I forget what the exact story was now but they gave him what they were doing the city or the county had gotten out there and they're moving that dirt for some purpose and then the excess dirt they were going to put down in the bay and create a little beach area down there. That's exactly what he was saying. And if you, you know, however long it took to move that little mountain uh, with all this earth moving equipment, all of a sudden one day he looked out his window and he had a beautiful view of the bay. Now that's, <laughs> you say, well, that's, uh, you know, I don't know if I believe that. Well, believe it or not, it's, it's what the Bible teaches. And if the Bible teaches it, then we have to choose to believe what God said. Amen? I am running out of time here. All right. So, we're going to be imitators of God. We're going to copy his example. We're going to do the things God does. Like God, we're his children. Amen? So, here's a question. If, if you've done this, or maybe you've met people that have tried some of these things, and <clears throat> their response is, well, I'm not sure why, but it doesn't. it didn't work for me. 
I tried it. It didn't work. Well, first of all, we don't try. We do. And, and so what if it, I try it? What if I, I step out and do something and it doesn't work? You don't stop because you don't see the results you desired. We walk by faith, not by sight. Sometimes the distance, time-wise, between amen and there it is, is because we haven't built our faith yet. We got a hold of a revelation, and that's great. But faith don't come by a revelation. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word. I get revelations every time I study and meditate on the Word of God. But that doesn't build faith. That's revelation. Now i got to go to the Word and meditate on the revelation from the Word to build faith in what I saw in the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word. Okay? So here's what happens. People get, they see something in the Word. Maybe they get a revelation. Maybe they hear a preacher. And um, they get excited about it. And they're going to run out there and they're going to jump on this and do it. And I think this is part of the reason why uh, back in the early 70s, the faith message got a bad rap because so many people were jumping out and doing stuff not understanding the process of growing your faith and they would fall flat on their face and so they'd go away with a bad testimony and give give this teaching a bad name but they didn't take the time to learn the principles all they got was the, they wanted the miracle the miracle without the work you know if you're going to get the miracle you got to put in the work amen all right praise god <clears throat> So here's what people were doing. They weren't praying and they weren't declaring or confessing things in faith. They were doing it in hope. Now faith and hope are two different things. Hope is our vision, our goal, where we want to arrive. But it's always future. It's always someday. It's always out there in front of us. But the Bible says now, Faith is. When? Right now. It is. What? The substance of the things we hoped for. The evidence of things not seen, not yet manifested. So we've got to go to the Word of God, and we've got to take the Word of God, and we've got to begin to meditate upon that Word pertaining to the healing of our bodies, or the finances, or relationships, or a job, or whatever else it is that we need. We take God's Word... We meditate upon that. And here's what happens. I'm just going to wrap this up here in the next three minutes. But here's what happens. As we meditate the Word, and I'm condensing uh, four more pages of notes. I'm on page two right now. We meditate the Word of God, which means we take the, the revelation of the promise, and we begin to declare that over our situation. We, what do we do? We're speaking words. We're speaking words of faith. We're speaking what God has said about our situation. Now, you know and I know, words paint pictures in our minds. If I say dog, everybody out there sees a different kind of dog. If I say a German dog, immediately almost everybody's going to think German Shepherd. If I say little dog, well, you can forget the German Shepherd. Now, you, what, what little German dog, well, Schnauzer maybe, I don't, I don't know. I'm not that familiar with small breeds, but... But you understand what I'm saying? The moment I say big dog, we eliminate the little dogs. All right? So what happens is words paint pictures. When you meditate the Word of God, you're speaking the words of God. They will paint a new picture. It's called renewing the mind. They will paint a new picture. Now, let me tell you when faith is manifested. When, without thinking about it, your first thought in the morning about the thing you're dealing with is what God said, instead of the problem, faith is ready. It's there. When the last thing you think about the situation you're dealing with at night, without trying to, just the last thought in your mind before you fall asleep, is what God said about it, then it's there. You're at the point of a powerful release of faith. If the last thought you have about the thought, the things you've been dealing with at night are, oh Lord, I hope it works. I hope it, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got this and I got that. You, you're not in faith yet. You're still in hope. I hope it works. No, you got to get from hope to it's done. It's a done deal. The first thought you have about that situation when you wake up in the morning, you wake up and, and say, praise God, Father, I thank you. I am healed. Hallelujah. Or Father, I thank you. I have my new home. Father, I thank you. I have my new job. 
whatever it is you're believing for. If that's the first thought about that situation without trying to and trying to stop and think about what the word says, when it starts coming out of you, you got faith. It's there. All right? Your faith level has been built to the point of being able to receive now. Now when you begin to declare it, faith is going to work out there. It's being released by your words and it's going out there. If you had faith, you would say, remember Jesus said that. And then it begins to bring to manifestation that thing you've been believing for. I got about two minutes, so I'm going to wrap it up. And um, I didn't get near as far as I thought I was going to get tonight, but we did good. I'm going to start Hebrews chapter 11 next week, verse 1. Go there and study that if you want. But take what you've been hearing tonight. Meditate upon the things I've been saying. I got off into some side trails, but all of them were meant to bring you back to how to develop our faith. All right, we want heart faith, spiritual faith, not head faith. Amen? Amen. Listen, we want to say thank you once again to all of our partners. You've been so faithful to us, and we just bless you and thank God for you. You are literally helping us do the things we're doing, doing this teaching, getting the word out, ministering to people. We are ministering to people around the world. I see a post every day from people in other countries that are watching and listening to the word that I'm teaching, and it's blessing people in other countries. So you're a valuable part. If you're watching and you're being blessed and you're not a partner with us, why don't you pray about it? See, when you become a partner with us, number one, we put you in our daily prayer list. By name, we go before the Lord on your behalf. Number two, you share in the rewards of the work that's done for the kingdom of God. Whatever we do, if you're a partner with us, that makes you part of what we're doing. And whatever God does through us, you're credited with the same thing. That's valuable. So we want to offer that to you. We've got a few of you that are watching that are partners with us. We love you. We thank you for that faithfulness. Anybody out there you want to join with us, uh, you can give and support us financially on a monthly basis as partners uh, by giving, uh, mailing uh, to uh, P.O. Box 4238, West Hills, California, 91308. If you've got PayPal and you want to use PayPal, uh, you can, uh, our PayPal account uh, email is W-E-M-M-O-N-S, so w -E -M -M -O -N -S, 01, the numeral 0 and 1, at gmail.com, w -E -M -M 01 at gmail.com. And we have partners that are giving online. They're giving uh, through our PayPal account. We have partners that are uh, singing checks in. Uh, we get them in the mail every week. Thank you so much. We love you guys. We pray for you. Have a blessed week. We're going to pick this up right where we left off next week. And we will see you then. And forgive me for getting up and leaving the screen blanks. i got to go shut the camera off. See you next week.